Not everybody is called by God to write scripture, but he took it real serious. Now, I put up there the order in which I think, and this is my opinion, but I'm going to give all of you a copy of it so you can decide for yourselves, or I'm going to put copies of it back on the table. Which order of the Bible books were written? Books were written. I think Mark started it and John ended it. It's just that simple. And he talks about in his gospel things that nobody else talks about. And the thing that he emphasizes in the life of Jesus, if, you're, if your Bible has a beginning to it, you'll see Something like that. This is a Schofield King James Bible, which is just the Bible I grew up with. Uh, but he says the theme of the book is Christ the Servant. This book, more than any other book in Scripture, except for maybe James, and James was also a person who lived in Jerusalem, and he was head of the church in Jerusalem. And so Mark, I'm sure, knew James, the half-brother of Jesus. These two books are about being the servant, being the servant. Uh, now, the book of Mark is unique in the fact that it's a very primitively written book. He was not highly educated, even though he was brought up with the Old Testament by his mother and his grandmother. He did not have the intellectual education that Paul did being a Pharisee and going through the theology courses that he went through. Uh, it was just a primitive. Uh, and it's work-oriented. He really says in this book, faith without works is dead, which is exactly what James says. The book is really about the deeds of Jesus. Just about the deeds. He went from town to town doing things for people over and over again. More healing in Mark than any other book. And he just went around to serve people. Uh, I told you dating the New Testament is almost impossible uh, because there were no dates written on any of the books. But uh, somewhere between... Uh, after Jesus died in 69 A.D., uh, was when all the books were written. Because not one book in the New Testament mentions the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in 70 A.D. So all of them had to be written before then because they would have talked about the destruction of their home, the center of their theology, the place where Jesus died. They would have talked about all that. And it's not mentioned in any book in the New Testament. Uh, it's the simplest book in the New Testament, the book of Mark. And it really says to you and me, our job is to go out and be servants. Serve whatever way you can, any way you can, all that you can. And that means totally giving up your own time sometimes. And that's hard to do, especially if you've got a ranch and cattle and uh, all kinds of livestock you've got to take care of and land you've got to worry about. It's tough to do all that. But he says, I want you to be my servants when you're grown, is what he really says. There are three terms in the New Testament that talk about us as believers. First of all, it talks about us being sons of God. And it doesn't mean just men, it means women too. And I've told you this before, anytime in the, in the Hebrew or in the Greek, when there is 20 women and one guy, it's always referred to in the masculine. It's just the way the language was constructed and written. Uh, so being sons of God merely means being sons and daughters of God. Now, when children are small, uh, as many are, as we've heard this morning, uh, 
Uh, uh, and it's a blessing that they're here. I, I never complain about children making noise. But when they're real little, they are our sons and daughters. They haven't grown to the point where they can make good decisions or even make decisions yet, unless they've hit two. And we all know what that's about. But uh, mo for the most part, they're still sons and daughters. And they're, this is the, the term in, in theology that refers to our infancy. And then all of a sudden, uh, after we make it through, if we make it through the twos, uh, we become children of God. And that lasts for a long, long time. There's a growth process through being a child of God that leads us closer and closer to God, hopefully. Because he's what's important. We should all have a faith that God put us with the right parents. Whether we have one or whether we have two or whether we have a, a bunch. Um, there's a guy I know that uh, lives in, in Sheridan that uh, he and his wife and their three children live with his in-laws. Uh, and they live on different levels in a house. But there are three generations of people living in the house. So these children essentially have more than one, quote, parent or authority figure. But soon after we get to some point in our life, I'm not sure what it is. Uh, uh, Abraham Isaac lived with his dad his whole life. Uh, he didn't get a wife until he was 40. So I'm not sure what that says about the way we do things today. But uh, that was the way God planned it. and He took over the family business eventually. Uh, but some point in time, we end up growing from sons to children to servants. And that's the most mature aspect in the New Testament is the servanthood of our, of our belief system. That's where we go around and serve people. and don't have a an agenda that we keep up front to guide us. We allow God to do so instead. And that's the toughest one because it means we give up everything, even our own uh, time, our, our own priorities to become servants and do whatever God wants us to do instead. Now, uh, I also put on here where the where these books were probably written. Uh, the J stand, uh, appears Jerusalem. Uh, the C is Corinth because Paul was going back and forth between uh, Greece and Turkey and and uh, his hometown of I forgot what I said it was of uh, Antioch. Uh, and uh, Ephesus, T, the little T means he's traveling. It's not specific where he was. Uh, the R is he was in Rome. Can you imagine being such a problem for the Roman Empire that they decide to kill you? That, that's what happened to Paul. He became such a problem because everywhere he went, he was destroying their little gods and telling him about the God and was causing problems everywhere he went. And so they decided they had to get rid of him. So he ended up going to Rome and dying there. Uh, the J is Jerusalem. Uh, Peter even talks about uh, in his book uh, about Give sending greetings from the people in Babylon. Uh, and at the time Peter was there, uh, there were Jews, Christians, new Christians, the church started there. And then there were Arabs that were there. And there were Romans that were there. So most of the people that were there were pagans. They weren't believers in Jesus Christ. So he ends up calling it Babylon. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but... Um, this is not the only reference to him calling or Jerusalem being called Babylon. Uh, 
And of course, Paul ends up uh, writing the last book of the scripture on the Greek island of Patmos, uh, John. Yeah. She's asking me questions. And it's okay. You can ask questions. You don't have to raise your hand. Uh, so <clears throat> the outline for the New Testament is really uh, here. Uh, Paul wrote, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 14 books. Paul wrote 14 books in the New Testament, and Luke, his physician, traveled with him and recorded the history of the church starting. That's what the, the book of Acts is all about. It's really about Luke, Dr. Luke, following Paul around on his journeys and making notes about everything that happened. He was, uh, he was not Jewish. Uh, it never tells where he got his training from, but 32% of the Bible was New Testament was written by Paul, and another 27% was written about Paul. So that's 59% of the New Testament was influenced by Paul. And as a matter of fact, the book of Mark was influenced by Paul. He followed Paul around collected all these things and took them back to Jerusalem and sat down and wrote them all down. Uh, that accounts for the other uh, 20% of, of Scripture is written by the other guys. Or 21%. Yeah, 21%. Matthew, James, Peter, and Jude. <coughs> So you understand the writings of Paul were, were very important. And the thing about Mark is Mark made Paul so mad that Paul started writing about it all. He, you can look through the book of Acts and Luke records the argument between Paul and, and Mark. And Paul didn't like that Mark left. And then finally later on in the book of Acts, Mark comes back and Paul accepts him. Paul had written more than Luke by then, Mark by then. So it was okay. But the important part about Mark is, is that Mark talks about being a servant. And if you want to read a book about how do I be a better servant, you need to read the book of Mark. Now on the back of this is just the way I did it. Uh, back in 2018, on the back of the, on the back of this page, uh, there's a, you can go through the New Testament in three months. And they're short readings. You can read the whole New Testament in three months. Uh, and, of course, it starts with uh, Luke and Mark, Luke and John, uh, and it goes all the way to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to put these back there on the back when I'm through and let you take them. Uh, there are only... Nine authors of the entire New Testament. And I, there, I, I put a number. There's the first six. Paul takes up a whole lot of it until you get down to James, number seven. <clears throat> so, what we're looking at is theology that was dictated by God through nine people. And they all agree. There's no errors. There's no discussion. There's no, this guy says that and this guy says that. Which one's right? They all agree. 
They all agree 100%. And I've even put on here, uh, there's 138,162 Greek words in the Greek New Testament, which is important. There are 184,600 English words. So I think a woman wrote the New Testament <laughs> or translated it. No, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you can't, there are, there are not equivalent words. And one has to explain what it says. Matter of fact, when I read to you this morning that it came to pass in those days that Jesus came. <clears throat> the word it came to pass is an Old Testament thought. And I've told you this before. And it's one word in, in Hebrew. And it's H-A-Y-A-H, Hayah. We all live in this Hayah moment in life. And, and the word is often translated and it came to pass. So that's taken one word. And making five out of it, I had to count them. I was taking one Hebrew word and making five words out of it. But that's not even the full meaning of it, because any word that ends with Y-A-H is a, ref- is a reference to God himself, Yah, Yahweh. Uh, in all of the Psalms, David refers to God poetically as Y-A-H. I guess it was easier to rhyme in Hebrew. I don't know. But uh, the word actually means, and God allowed it to happen this way for a reason, and here's the reason. That's it. But, you know, that's there's a lot packed into some of our words also. Uh, when you say somebody got divorced, well, that's a... What, what, what all did it involve? I mean, that's, that's a life story almost. Uh, or so and so went to jail. Well, that's a, that's a long story too. Uh, and sometimes we just use short, small words to encompass a lot that went on. And that's what it is with the word Hayah. So you understand that there are no word for word translations of the New Testament. So I'm going to make a couple of statements. Uh, and my job is to tell you the truth. And, and since I read Hebrew and Greek, uh, if you ask me a question, whether you like it or not, I'm going to tell you what the scripture says. And you aren't always going to like it. I got news. I, mean, I don't know anybody that does. I don't even like it always. I had struggle after struggle after struggle in seminary because I did not agree with what the Hebrew or the Greek was telling me. And, and it was a growing exercise through seminary that uh, I'm surprised I made it. Of course, it only took me 12 years to do a four-year degree. But uh, that was part of the struggle. Also, anybody want to guess how many English translations of the Bible there are? Venture a guess. Huh? What did you say? 24. You said 124? 184,600. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> uh, there, there are actually 10,000 uh, translations of the Bible, but there are 900 translations just in English. Which one's right? So you understand there's a problem translating from one language to another and maintaining the idea of truth. And that's what's so hard. That's why there are so many translations. It's like uh, we, we should put them all together. I'm sure AI is trying to do this, but... Uh, uh, we should put them all together and, 
and and see what the sentence would really say, and it would probably end up tripling that or quadrupling it or something. I don't, it would be hum, it would be the New Testament would be a book this thick, uh, <clears throat> but it would give you an idea of the uncertainty that's built into translations. There just aren't any perfect translations, and I don't say that to say it's going to mess you up or cause problem. God is responsible for putting the truth in you even through bad translations. And that's what you've got to trust more than anything, is that God is capable of putting the truth in you. That's going a long way around to talk about the book of Mark, but uh, matter of fact, you may have gotten lost. You know, we're still talking about the book of Mark. Uh, the, the important thing to me is, what is the basis for your belief in the way God gave us his word? And if Mark was the first one and he started off telling us we need to be servants, that's important. Because he, he, he records things no other gospel records. I would tell you all of them, but it'd be a long list. Uh, but have you ever heard the thought plenary inspiration of the Bible? No? Plenary? P L E N A R Y? <clears throat> In 2 Timothy 3.16, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And that inspiration of God thought is an extraordinary, supernatural, divine influence pushed the word onto us. So that those who wrote the scriptures did it without error. And I, you've probably seen that. Uh, overhead that I've put up here before that shows all the cross-references in the Bible. Now, those cross-references that are on that chart are only by chapter. They are not by verse. Uh, it, the, it, would take, it would take the entire wall to do one by verse. There are so many cross-references uh, in, in scripture that is just unbelievable and separated by hundreds of years from author to author. Uh, so the, the idea of plenary inspiration is God breathed it into humanity, into certain people, and they wrote it. It was not dictated. It was inspired. You ever been inspired to do something and you wonder whether it was right and then you did it and it turned out perfect? It's the same thing. I, I don't have any of those in my life, according to. These are some of the characteristics of the Book of Mark uh, that are only in Book of Mark. So the, the overview is Mark has a unique perspective to educate you and me with, that's the education a servant needs to be a servant. And that's a growth, that's a growth process. Uh, kids are not, sons and daughters are not expected to do that. Children are not expected to do that. Servants are. That's why I put the reading list on the back. Uh, God expects us to grow. He expects us to grow beyond us. And to be something to them, all the people around us. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've outlined the book of Mark just because of that. So I'm not going to. <clears throat> but keep in mind that Mark is but part of the 21%. I didn't even put Mark on it. Matthew, James, Matthew, Mark, James, Peter, and Jude. But the idea is for us to, at 
by the by the time we get to August, because I'm going to cover in general the the books of Paul. And you know why Paul wrote those books? Because every one of those churches was having problems. So what it says to us is all churches have problems. Just like all marriages have problems. It's a question, do we love each other enough to, to work it out? That's really what it's all about. I didn't, I didn't get to be married almost 52 years now uh, by not having problems. It's because we loved each other enough to work it out. That's all. That's what it takes. Uh, the writings of Luke, he only wrote two books. The book of Luke, the book of Acts, there's a high probability because he was so well educated that he might have written uh, part of the book of Hebrews. Uh, which I put on this chart. Uh, that it's not known who really wrote it, uh, but it's it uses the words of Mark, but it has the theology of Paul. And so, and since Paul did not normally write his own books, it may have been Luke who wrote it. That's what those are up there for. Uh, but the idea you can carry away today is, Mark is about what? Being a servant. And that's, that's the last hurdle in the life of a believer is to be the servant. And that's that's the tough one. We got to grow up and put our big big boy pants on, our big girl pants on, and uh, and and meet the requirements. I'm not going to show you that. You don't need to see that. Uh, so these will go on the back. Uh, but the idea is to end up. Covering all the books of the New Testament in general, not specific, and then end up with the Revelation of John, which is in the Greek the Apocalypse. And that's where we're headed, and hopefully we'll get there to the book, August the fourth. Uh, I don't know how long we have, but hopefully we'll have enough time to get to the book by August the fourth. Let's close in a prayer. Heavenly Father, you called each person in this room as a son or a daughter into your kingdom to be your children. You've walked us through the infancy stage. You've walked us through the childhood stage. Help us to grow and become the servants that you need for us to be so that we might affect the world in a mighty, mighty way as we go through it. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.